Hey, good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a nice day today. Can you all hear me? Put your headphones on. Clap for the silent disco. This is how we clap silently. Uh, cool. My name is John Craw. I'm a senior software development engineer at Amazon Web Services. Um, work for perimeter protection. Our department's primarily concerned with protecting the border of Amazon Web Services and Amazon.com and all of your resources inside of AWS, especially CloudFront distributions, Route 53 hosted zones, and all of the regional resources like instances and load balancers. This morning we're going to talk about distributed denial of service attacks, what Shield can do for you, how you can leverage WAF, and go from there. So first we'll start with a brief primer. It's like any course, you know, got a good understanding of what is DDoS and what kind of resources, who can be affected by it. We'll go over what AWS does in the shared responsibility model to create insight, and then how you can access those insights. Uh, and finally, we'll wrap up with why everyone should have a response plan before you're under attack. Before we jump into all that, if you were here yesterday, or if you look at the live stream, there's a great talk by Kamal Verma from Dow Jones uh, goes very deep on uh, some of these DDoS topics and how they protect their perimeter on AWS. And later today, there's a builder session with Cameron Worrell where you can learn how to use uh, Inspector and WAF and System Manager. So take a close look for these, find them if you can. Some great speakers here. All right, so let's talk what is DDoS. I'm going to start from the bottom of this acronym and talk about the service. Uh, any kind of service that we're delivering is uh, a bunch of links in a chain. There's all components that go together to deliver a service from you who's built it to your consumers, your customers, who you're trying to provide value to. It includes some networking level, includes some infrastructure, like you might have some EC2 instances or load balancers, uh, and it includes any applications that you've written on top of that that are running in, say, API Gateway or an application load balancer. Uh, or in CloudFront distribution. The denial of any of these services just takes one of those links in the chain to knock out the ability of you to deliver value to your customers. So attackers will often try and find the weakest link in the chain. They'll try to overwhelm the network with a bunch of uh, volume and packets just to congest it. Uh, they'll try to target your infrastructure and prevent you from accepting new connections. Uh, or they'll go to the very top level and play with the application, try to be, um, try to stress it out in a way that's abnormal, or if they're very clever, it'll be as normally look, looking as possible, uh, but they won't actually care about the results, or they'll just be trying to stop uh, login attempts. The final bit, it's distributed. So these attacks are coming from a wide variety of sources it's not as easy as just finding that one malicious person or computer and blocking it. They're coming from all over the internet. So this is the, uh, the type of problem that we're going to talk about today. To drill, to drill a little bit deeper on each of those pieces, take a look at this diagram. It's a mock-up mock of a network. Um, you've got a bunch of happy light blue and dark blue users, uh, and you've got this malicious user mixed in there. They've flooded this link from their ISP through an internet exchange uh, to one of CloudFront's edge locations. And now that location can't accept new uh, requests or send new responses to anybody else because it's been saturated. So CloudFront will automatically handle network type events. Um, but, and that's on our side of the shared responsibility model, how we protect the network so that wherever your resource is, you'll always have uh, some network available. We build lots of excess capacity to make sure that we can provide that service to you. Um, UDP floods are very common. They're over 60% roughly of, uh, of all DDoS attacks. And their objective is to fill up a pipe like this by sending uh, small requests that get very large responses and directing them to our target. Uh, or you could be the reflector in either case, they're filling up the pipe with requests that they don't care about the content of. You may recall in uh, the recent few years, the largest one of these was 1.7 terabits per second. Just 
think about that for a while. That's a huge amount of, uh, of volume to handle. Uh, meanwhile, more recently, just in the first quarter, we observed a uh, 762 gigabit per second flood of this type and automatically rerouted traffic around it. Bringing it up a step, the next type of, uh, next categories of attack would be looking at connection exhaustion or transport exhaustion. Um, same type of users, we've abstracted away the network, say that we're, you're getting to any one of these locations and a bunch of hosts within are maintaining connection with each of the customers. Um, so customers ABC might have made a few requests or a small or a large number of requests and the malicious user labeled E is just trying to fill up that table with as many connections as they can that are uh, half open. It's a common type of attack, uh, also known as a sin flood. Um, that's the second largest type of DDoS attacks are these connection exhaustion attacks. And in recent years, there's been an attack as large as 500 million packets per second. And just think, if this one little host has to take 500 million connection requests, hold the connection open faithfully, and then get silence on the line, like, great, I've got the connection for you, now what do you want? Um, but this type of attack would open that connection, get a host waiting for the request, and drop it. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, we saw one of these attacks was as large as 260 million. So it's half as large as the biggest one that we've ever seen. And at the highest level uh, in the stack, there's application stressing attacks. So within a particular host or service, there are finite resources. It's not, everything's not infinite, but you can, go, you can consider in general that there's compute and there's in-memory and there's I.O. on disk or across the network. Uh, and any one of these could be the target of, uh, of a stress. A malicious user might have found that your service will calculate some prime numbers, for example, and they could keep requesting and cause it to spend a lot of compute cycles doing that. Or it might be accumulating some data and the, the attacker could tell it to accumulate meaningless amounts of data, taking up memory. Uh, or a very common one is that it, uh, disk or, mem or network will be consumed by this malicious attacker. In all cases, the attacker is trying to find an expensive request to make your server work hard and then doesn't care about the response. Say you have a login page, just the final example here. They could certainly be doing some kind of a credential attack, very sophisticated, trying to find a way in, but to deny the service, all they have to do is keep trying harder and harder and harder and cause that login page to go down, and now your users can't log in at all. So to sum up, we have network level attacks, transport that go to the infrastructure, and application level attacks, the most sophisticated, that try to behave like a, a real consumer but are just stressing you out. So who can be affected? What kinds of resources can be affected? For the network link, anything that's on the internet can be affected. The best thing you can do to protect against network attacks is to, to leave all of the stuff you don't need on the internet off the internet. If you've got a, a multi-tiered application, only expose the very top tier, the web-facing tier. You obviously wouldn't want to put your database right on the internet, but you'd be surprised how often that happens. Uh, or, you know, have an S3 bucket that's public um, when it could be private. Transport layer. Anytime that a connection is being tracked, we can, uh, an attacker can exhaust that tra tracking resource. So TCP is a stateful protocol. You're sure uh, you're aware of the three-way handshake, the SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. That's a deliberate and explicit type of connection tracking. But you may not be aware uh, UDP also has connection tracking in load balancers in AWS, uh, and so it could also be a subject of exhaustion attacks. And finally, on the application layer, CloudFront distributions, um, API gateways, application load balancers, anything that has an HTTP presence and accepts a, a GET or a POST type of request, sends a response back, can 
you know, be subject to an application attack where the attacker simulates your application but doesn't care about the result. So some of the network resources are uh, VPC. That gives you a footprint, virtual private cloud here in, uh, in Amazon. It's analogous to having a network in on-premise. Um, EC2 instances, these are your virtualization layer. Uh, these are all subject to the lowest level, only to network. Um, then you go to get up to hosted zones and global accelerators and classic and network load balancers. These all have uh, connection tracking built in. And at the highest level, application, APIs, and distributions are full HTTP applications. So they're subject to all three layers of, of attack. For each one of these things, I've listed a few best practices just to get you to jump, to jump started. Um, but we don't, we don't drill into these too much. Uh, these are just a jumping point. But definitely use security groups and network ACLs. Um, limit the surface area that's exposed. Use elastic IPs wherever possible so you can change the IP of an instance uh, without restarting the instance entirely. Um, if you're using DNS, which of course you are, type in Amazon.com, search for bananas. Uh, you've already used DNS this morning. So if you can help it, use Route 53 because we've built in specialized DNS protections uh, that are always on for, for DNS in the cloud. Uh, Global Accelerator is pretty cool. Um, allows you to use a single IP or up to four IPs and direct to load balancers across any region. Leads right into the next point, the, the load balancers. It's a step up. It's like, like an upgrade of having an instance. Um, easily scales out. You can apply scaling rules, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And at the last level, these applications are best coupled with WAF so that you can see as much visibility as possible into what types of requests are coming, get some insight about that, and definitely for CloudFront, get that always on protection. Uh, I can't forget, our partners have built a lot of great rules. Whether you're installing a, like a network protection appliance at the VPC, uh, or if you're applying a WAF partnered rule, there's a huge variety of, of partner solutions available to, to help protect against DDoS and other security problems. So third segment here, we're going to talk a little bit about what AWS does, uh, how we act all the time, how we react to attacks, and how we create insights. For the network level, Amazon has a huge footprint of routers and locations. We collect aggregated NetFlow from all the routers and switches around uh, the border of our network and centralize those into uh, regional aggregations. Uh, in addition, we have some specialized, some custom uh, inline scrubbing devices. For CloudFront and Route 53, these are always inline, and we're always receiving that data and doing that, that scrubbing work. Uh, for regions, these are inline by reaction, but in both cases, we collect metrics back from those scrubbers and decide, uh, and then shapers and vectors that are collected on those scrubbers to get a more detailed view of what type of traffic is crossing and whether it is a DDoS attack or if it's legitimate. Uh, we use this, these NetFlow logs to prioritize effort. Uh, NetFlow, you're probably already thinking, well, that's not every packet. How are you protecting me if you don't look at every packet and confirm if it's a good or a bad one? Well, that's okay. DDoS is a big volume event. So if we only look at samples, we'll still be able to tell uh, when a, a drastic change in the population and the size of that population has, has occurred. Um, it's especially useful because under a uh, high volume attack, you don't want to get less efficient, you don't want to start retrying requests and, and so on. The bigger the volume of requests is, the more efficient we get at determining whether it's under attack or not. And we also use these uh, lossy data points as just a starting to draw attention, put one of those inline scrubbing devices on, and then get full vision of the vectors and shapers. Uh, in both cases, we distill exabytes of information down to just a few points of data that uh, give a good profile of what the traffic looks like. So that includes looking at source IPs and deciding out of this population, um, at this moment, it, had a, it looked like 
100 IPs from these various regions, give it an entropy score that says, that describes it, and then from the next moment, decide a new entropy score that if it has grown to 1,000 IPs and now they're in entirely different geographic regions, then the entropy changes. And we just look at uh, spikes of volume and entropy changes to decide when um, an attack is starting. So for example, see UDP port 11211 has a huge increase in volume and the stability of those IPs that are targeting us are, have changed a lot. That's a UDP flood on this particular port that you might have heard of, uh, memcache. So up to the next level, for transport and connection exhaustion attacks, we go a, a level deeper and collect some more metrics from, uh, from the hosts and infrastructure, um, track whether connection is initialization is successful or failing, uh, look at some common health metrics like CPU and memory on the instance, uh, or success fail metrics on an HTTP uh, application, but that's the most basic level. We still are using some of that lossy data from the previous slide uh, to start this, in this inspection. Um, but that allows us, by, by really quickly collecting just samples, allows us to quickly react even before sometimes an impact is observed. We can get that scrubber in place and block the attack entirely. Uh, at the minimum, we use that quick reaction to upgrade from sampled NetFlow to getting perfect data from the in-scrubbing device, the inline scrubbing device. Example at this level is uh, you get a huge increase in SYN packets. At our NetFlow, we, see, we can see that. Just, there's a lot more SYN packets happening, why? Uh, and the host is emitting some connection errors, You're probably under uh, a SYN flood or a half-open attack. At that point, we would put the inline scrubber in, in place, and it would start to negotiate uh, SYNs with any new connection, open one up, uh, handle it before it gets to the host, and only when the ACK has come back, only when that connection is confirmed, then move the connection from the scrubbing device down to the target host. Now at the top level at applications, the best thing to do is some, collect some logs. So these will all usually come in a very common format, W3C. Uh, other formats are possible, you can do whatever you prefer. I prefer to get mine from WAF. That way, across all three of these resources, the logging is consistent. But in addition, CloudFront, Application Load Balancer, API Gateway also can provide logs in the format that you specify uh, and directly to any target that you wish. So instead of WAF, you could send the logs to Elasticsearch or to CloudWatch Insights um, or even just to S3. Just hold on to those for, for later. Once you have these, once we have these logs, then we model the traffic to your application. An example application might have a home page. You've just come from, you just, you just woken up and gone to Amazon.com, and then you've logged into your account, searched for bananas, add them to your cart, go to the payment page, check out, thank you page, and then log out. Just an example. Um, we model the application traffic uh, to each URI, in, in order to assert, determine that, say, when a large amount of requests are coming to the login page compared to before, it's likely that there's a login attack, either trying to deny logins by taking down the login page uh, or trying to brute force or credential stuff uh, and expose one of, one of your users. Uh, we, also, we profile on all, tops, all kinds of attributes to get the top contributors and compare them from past times that had a healthy status to the current anomaly or the current attack time and try and figure out what's the one thing that's common about all of the attack requests. Most of the time, attackers, even if they have a huge variety of, of sources, even from a variety of geographic regions, there will be something that's common. User agent might have a typo. Uh, they may be requesting the same exact URI over and over but there's, there's a little attribute in there somewhere that we can pick out and difference between a, a good period and a bad period to build a pattern and block it.
So for Route 53 and CloudFront, we have some always on protections, which is, is fantastic. Uh, 169 edge locations around the world, trying to get the lowest latency and highest availability. Route 53 has an amazing SLA guarantee of 100%. Uh, CloudFront is 99.9, uh, I believe. And to guarantee that availability across all of those locations, we are constantly validating protocol, uh, making sure that TCP connections are not left half open, um, no invalid HTTP requests, no invalid DNS requests, and just taking advantage of these two services will get right in the door, we'll get you these, these protections. Uh, in addition, in regions where we don't always have the scrubbers in line, uh, we'll take reaction. So I was mentioning before how to detect when an event happens. We put that, that scrubber in place, then we're upgrading the connection tracking and upgrading the network protection and protocol validations for these resources as well, uh, automatically. Uh, for the application level, for CloudFront, Application Load Balancer, API Gateway, these are uh, more of a suggestion that investigation is required. It's very difficult to set an automatic response and say, oh, you have an HTTP flood, what should I block? Maybe I shouldn't block anything at all. HBO goes live with Game of Thrones on Sunday night and there's a huge spike of traffic, but that's not a DDoS attack, that's normal customer traffic. Uh, so in this case, we always just send the notification, just draw the attention, here's a strange thing that's happening. If it's bad, do a deep dive in logs and find what the attribute is. If you're expecting it, then no worries. Uh, and we're always on hand to help. So call cloud support, call uh, DRT directly if you're a Shield Advanced customer, that's the DDoS response team. And we'll happily help you sort through the logs uh, if the logs are available, hopefully. So that's the, if there's one thing you do, enable logging. Now let's talk about some of these insights I've been mentioning and look at a few of them in detail. So a lot of these are available in the console and the API. If uh, you've subscribed to Shield Advanced, you'll see a great amount of detail of attack traffic and have access to the global threat environment dashboard with drill down views from two weeks down to a day. Uh, and in addition, every quarter you'll get a security report describing what's going on with AWS and around the internet and what can you do to best protect. Uh, in addition to Shield Advance, AWS WAF has some insights built in uh, that we'll look at. And all of these are, are backed by CloudWatch metrics. So uh, even without Shield Advance and WAF, you can still stuff logs into CloudWatch and, uh, and get some of these great insights. So here's an example, a quote from the recent uh, Shield Advanced Quarterly Report. Thanks for being a customer. Uh, the highlights from this one were uh, for automatic DDoS protection. We've got new well-formed HTTP request validation for CloudFront, new reliable DNS request uh, validation for Route 53. Uh, we've got some summaries of what happened in the last quarter, like uh, in addition to the two data points I mentioned before about UDP and SYN floods, uh, we saw a total of 253,000 attacks in the last 90 days. Uh, the largest one, I already mentioned those, um, 762 gigabits for a UDP reflection or 260 million packets per second for a SYN flood. Uh, and the last one was a 1 million requests per second application flood. We'll also have some uh, late breaking news, like recently we've released the, uh, a new vector of UDP reflection from Ubiquity Discovery Service. This security report will talk about what's going on with that and how you're automatically protected. Um, and some cool stuff like a new service integration with Firewall Manager. So if you're a Shield Advanced customer, you can use Firewall Manager now to apply policy and have any new resources automatically protected. Let's, start, let's dive in deep on some of these um, global threat environment points. As a Shield Advanced customer, you can come look at the console anytime, click down here on Global Threat Environment, and you can see a picture of the world and where attacks are happening mostly. They're in US, but also in Central Europe. Uh, you can see a summary 
of what's been happening in the last day or uh, up to two weeks. Drill in on, on the day, what hours are most common? Maybe lunchtime is the most common, who knows? But from time to time, you can come back to the threat environment dashboard and take a look at this graph and see uh, what time of day attacks are happening. And uh, these are the three, we got network level in the middle, we've got transport on the left and application level on the right. Um, over the course of the last day, there's been a steady stream of both network and transport attacks. Uh, application attacks are more rare, but there's been some, some spikes. So 60,000 requests per second, 80,000 requests per second in bursts here and there. Uh, that was the threat environment, so covering all of AWS. In addition, you can drill into your own account, and hopefully this is not you. This, this is my account, but if your account looks like this, you're having a bad day. Um, eight of your IPs are under attack, you have distribution under attack, and at the very right, in the last 24 hours, there's just been constant, constant attacks. Oh, you want to take a picture? Go ahead. So um, this will draw some attention. You know, you can drill in on ongoing attacks, click in, see what the details of each event are, uh, and you can use the API as well. So I'll briefly talk about the API before we jump back into the console to show the detail of these attacks. AWS SDK, it's pretty easy to, to submit these requests. Shield, list attacks. Um, I've alighted a lot, but the one at the top was a UDP reflection. And you can see what resources under attack, when did it start in Unix Epic, start and end. Uh, and with that attack ID, you can go and get some more details. So on the right, what IP was under attack. Uh, you'll see some counters and vectors that were included. This is just the, the backend API view, uh, but you might be able to use some scripting, um, get an alert, look at what the list, the attacks that are currently in progress, get the detail of it, and start from there um, to go on a, on a log deep dive for that particular resource. Here's what that looked like in the console. Each of these resources, the vector that was under attack, you can click on each one of those vectors and, and see the CloudWatch metric behind it. And after clicking on one of those attacks, here's this elastic IP, had lots of reflection, and get a graph over time of how many packets uh, were affected by this attack. Looks like a million packets per second for a long period of time. Now let's jump over to WAF. Uh, so say that the resource that was under attack was an application load balancer or uh, a CloudFront distribution. WAF will have additional details about the request volume in the last uh, several minutes. If you scroll down a little bit behind, below this graph, there'll also be some additional logging options, which we'll come to in a, in a moment. So moral of the story is all these insights that we build are built into CloudWatch. Uh, you can easily attach an alarm and get notified by paging or email. Uh, or even enact a, a Lambda function to go and pick up logs, parse them, and, and deliver some insight. Once again, the biggest thing you can do to start this project uh, of DDoS protection is getting logs before you're under attack. Even if you only send them to S3, there's still, uh, there's Athena, a great structured query language interface on top of that that you can use. Um, at the highest level, you can send them right to DRT during an event. And in between, there's automation that you can do, uh, engage a Lambda, parse these logs. Uh, there's other services that do constant curation, like sending the logs into CloudWatch uh, will build insights dynamically. Um, and at the worst, just save them for a rainy day. At the, at the end of the day, uh, you can always contact the DDoS response team as well anytime you like, not just when you're under attack, to review your posture, to help plan a response, to run a game day, to, pr to practice reaction. So use this resource um, to improve your you know, feeling about DDoS before, before you get attacked.
So this one here, this CloudWatch metric is the, the backbone of, of Shield. It just says for each particular resource, whether we determined it was or wasn't under attack. We often attach this metric to an alarm. And uh, when those alarms go into error, then send a notification to SNS, get an email, get a page, um, or also send them, to, uh, send them to a Lambda function to take reaction. So uh, why plan for DDoS? It's a shared responsibility. AWS covers a lot of it, and you cover a lot of it and we meet somewhere in the middle. So there's network, which you have little control over, but we do a great job of protecting all of our network assets. These are shared assets among all of all the customers and ourselves, uh, so it's in everyone's best interest that we build the best protections from the ground up. Um, the higher that we get into the stack, the more variation there is in, in customer resource. So it's more difficult to make automa automated, widespread automation, but each customer can definitely know their own logs, know their own traffic, and build an automated response to go in, in tandem with an attack notification. Remember uh, to architect from the beginning with security in mind and with availability in mind, not just as an afterthought. So um, don't forget uh, that you've hard-coded an instance size and type in, in some little page somewhere. Try to make that uh, really easy to modify so that when you do come under attack, you're not in a rush to figure out, oh, what is it that I have to, have to change? All those scale uh, factors are really easily accessible at the top. Best you can do is use load balancers that themselves have scaling built in. Uh, but even if you're using EC2 instances or other statically allocated resources, uh, use a CloudFormation template, have variables that are easily changeable. Uh, and of course, your engineers are going to be, your, or operators are going to be sleepy when they're under attack. It'll probably be 3 a.m. So document the plan so it's easy to understand. Uh, on, to, on top of the automatic notification and response, proactively collecting logs is the first step. Take a look at the logs, dive into them, see what is, is jumping out at you. And you'll be able to build um, your own profile like we do for network level, but build those profiles for application level as well. So you've got an understanding of what types of user agents are hitting your, your site, your application, um, what geographic areas from time to time are hitting and whether they're changing. Uh, and what we do, like take an example from how we do it on the network and transport level uh, by pre-calculating those profiles and having them ready. You may not even have to store the logs for a long period of time, but if you take logs and collect all the URIs, aggregate to the top 10, uh, collect all of the user agents, all the geographic regions that are uh, and, and any other HTTP attributes that you feel like and get a profile of those so that you can refer back to it at a later time and find what is the difference, what's the, what's the anomaly. Uh, and when you go to the Shield console, there's an easy button to enable DRT to access uh, your account and your logs if you'd like them to, uh, to be able to do that for you. So I promised before we'd look at some of the logging options. Here's the WAF console. Um, right below the request per second graph, just scrolling down a little bit, there's sampled requests. So any uh, anytime you can go here, get some new samples, and look at what IPs, what URI, um, and drilling in, you'll also see some of the top HTTP attributes like header, uh, like user agent. This is also available in the API. So you get under attack and you can automate uh, using, using some scripting AWS, of the AWS SDK. Um, in this example, I've taken a step backwards and started from listing the web ACLs and the rules. You'll need the ID of each of these to build a sampled requests call. Um, but then once you look for sampled requests, you can see over here, this particular request came from Brazil. It was to this URI. 
Uh, here, a handful of headers, accept, accept encoding, the particular user agent, and all the sampled logs will look like this, especially take note of the, the weight at the bottom. Um, because they're sampled, that weight will tell you this represents three requests or this represents 40 requests and use that for aggregating later. So if you take out the URI and start building a top URI list, use the weight um, as the key value to tell which ones are, are more or less common. You can also enable full logging. So if you start clicking here, it'll drill into um, how to enable logs. You'll need Kinesis Firehose. Uh, and then already set up to send those logs to wherever you need them to be. As we were mentioning before, send them right to S3 and you can use them for a rainy day or send them to uh, a Kinesis data stream, send them to a Lambda function, uh, send them to CloudWatch Insights. This is where you can set up uh, where those logs go. Uh, so here's the example of how to set up that, uh, that CloudWatch alarm. Just look under DDoS protection, look for DDoS detected on any particular uh, resource ARN, and when it's one, alarm. Trigger that Lambda function that will go back and look over the S3 bucket with the logs in it and pull out the top URIs. Put those URIs into an email and send it to your operator. Um, or in the worst case, wake somebody up, I need help, and get, it, get them paying attention to it, even if we don't know what the right action is immediately, to start looking at those logs and creating a response. This relies on, uh, on SNS, which is very dynamic. So using SNS, you can send them to an email, to a pager, or you can send them right to uh, anything that consume SNS, like SQS, to dynamically operate uh, on, on this notification. That SNS may, for example, trigger a Lambda function, um, or you may have a, a Lambda step function that's periodically going over the logs every five minutes, or say. And this is the, the backbone of, of notification, so get familiar with, with SNS and, uh, and CloudWatch alarms. and if all else fails, you can call for help. So get those logs ready, call cloud support, or call DDoS response team, and you can also get an IoT button, hit the button, call this Lambda function on this, uh, on this website here, Shield Engagement Lambda, and she, DRT will call you right back. So remember, if you take away one thing, it's logging. If you take away two things, it's look at those logs. Look at them proactively, build a profile of your application. That's what we do on the back end for network and transport layer all the time. And that's what we're starting to build for application layer attacks. Um, you can get flow logs, you yourself can get flow logs from VPC. Uh, even yesterday at the keynote was mentioned VPC flow mirroring, new feature uh, that will give in time copy of every packet or a filter set of packets from a particular ENI. Uh, so in addition to flow logs, flow mirroring. On EC2 instances, look at that health status, uh, enable the detailed monitoring so you can get uh, one step deeper into bandwidth and, and CPU and memory utilization. Um, and if you're running a particular application on this host, do something with your own logs. Uh, we'll never do something with your logs on an instance, but you can create, the, you can build uh, profiles of what's happening in your logs and use them to help us react in the future. For Route 53, query logging goes right to CloudWatch. For load balancers, put them into S3 and use Athena. And for, uh, in particular, application load balancers or any other HTTP, use WAF. 
or get the logs directly from them. Logs, did I say logs? All right, thanks for coming. I was John. Please remember to fill out a session survey on your mobile app before you go, and have a great morning.